gone through all these uh, talks by eminent speakers. Uh, it is uh, perhaps a good exercise on our part to revisit the position of psychology in the contemporary uh, Indian context. And uh, it's our uh, privilege to have uh, Professor Grishan Mishra here in our panel. In the book uh, Psychology in India, he has contributed a chapter on Psychology in India, Retrospect and Prospect. So, I invite you, sir, for your opening remarks. Uh, the chapter that you are referring to is concluding chapter of the exercise of fifth survey of research in psychology in India. It was sponsored by ICSSR and it tries to recapitulate the developments in psychology in India and looks into the details of professional and academic developments. I think it's right time to examine and uh, see how psychology has grown in India and what are the prospects for its future. Let me uh, make it clear that psychology as a discipline was introduced in India in terms of a standard discipline with definite content and boundary and it was imported from the European tradition as we know the kind of structure which was created by Professor Borjendranath Seal at Calcutta who was uh, asked to develop the program was largely based on European universities and it was accepted as it is and it transacted in the same manner. Now this kind of situation created a perspective that there is a definite kind of content and one should not make any effort to compromise with the details of that and therefore this was a new discipline while psychology as a <coughs> human phenomena deals with society and it has to be intrinsically cultural the principles theories which were taken as constituents of psychology discipline were considered as separate and uh, I think that many of the universities uh, maintained that stance and they hardly referred to Indian ethos or problems of Indian society or the work which was done in the Indian context. So a kind of insularity was there and that provided a kind of research output, a kind of training which maintained a distance from the Indian ethos. So we wanted to maintain the issues, questions, methods which were very similar to what was considered as standard in terms of Euro-American tradition and the academicians who were trying to uh, provide uh, leadership thought that it would be very appropriate to maintain that stance but after saying this I must mention that from the very beginning there were also certain attempts to look at the problems of society. They were not very prominent, but they did exist. For instance, the initiative by Girindra Shekhar Bose at Calcutta University, which uh, seems to be the beginning of the psychological discourse in India, was very much concerned with Indian ethos. His work on Oedipus complex 
his work on repression and his analysis of many of the issues within psychoanalysis provided a perspective which was different from Fry. And in fact, Fry wrote that it's good to see my work is being taken seriously in a land which is very far from his own uh, place, his own country. But, but he was not very happy with the kind of analysis which was presented by Girindra Shekhar Bose. Bose also made uh, a commentary on the work of Patanjali's Yoga Sutra. He also wrote a small book on scientific method. So a critical position was also taken. I also remember that it was 1909 when there was a treatise about the science of affect and emotions by an Indian author, Bhagwan Das, a philosopher. So there has been an attempt to look at problems from Indian perspective. They were not prominent. So there was recognition, but it did not influence the academic ethos and academic program of teaching. So this kind of division was maintained. So attention to the cultural processes was at a low key. Perhaps there was lack of familiarity with the kind of psychology which was developed in the Euro-American tradition. So people thought that let us consider it without any kind of compromise in its principles in its methods and I think that was a, a backdrop against which the courses started in different disciplines. Now with this beginning we find that psychology has gradually diversified. The different domains like psychological testing, experimental psychology, clinical psychology, social psychology have grown in various areas, in various domains, effort was made to examine theories and the received view of science which maintains hypothesis testing or examining critical predictions was considered to be the job of a psychologist and academician and that provided the kind of orientation to organize teaching and research. I think it was 70s that psychologists tried to change this perspective and they moved towards applied research where attention was paid to the problems of prejudice, problems of poverty, problems of mental health and I think the institutions like Nimhans and Similarly, institutions where psychiatric training was introduced, where professional training was introduced, like IIMs and other in training institutions, they created a new agenda that psychology has to grow in the direction of attending to problems of emerging society. A society which is growing in terms of technology, which is trying to capture the new developments taking place at global level. So this provided impetus for expansion of psychology. At the same time, the democratic aspirations of the country require opening of various academic centers, colleges, universities in various areas. And at this juncture we find that this unplanned expansion has led to some compromise with the quality of teaching and research. It is important that to consolidate a discipline and to help discipline grow as a knowledge enterprise, it is crucial that there should be proper manpower planning. It's unfortunate that 
in many university departments, the recruitment process was delayed and gradually there is lack of people, experts in different areas and it's really a challenge how to address that. At the same time, you will recognize that uh, in metropolitan cities, there is high demand for psychologists working in the clinical domain. Uh, we need counselors, we need clinical psychologists, we need people who work with various NGOs. So I think this sector is emerging in a prominent way and students of psychology are attracted towards such jobs and they are going to those uh, different areas where psychology has certain important application. So this is another change which has taken place. What I think is that with diversification, the kind of training which was required has not grown with quality. And I think the kind of teaching programs which are run at different departments and universities, they are more academically oriented and the kind of connection or link which is required with other institutions in society like hospitals or schools, I think that is missing. It's very unfortunate that we, we don't see the reciprocity and various academic disciplines maintain their own identity and that has led to kind of research which requires collaboration across different disciplines and that has not happened. So the study of poverty was done by psychologists or by political scientists or by sociologists and there is hardly any link across these various disciplines. It's one example. There are many issues which require inputs from different disciplines. So lack of collaboration across disciplines is another problem. So the kind of work which has been done by psychologists has attended to psychologization of various issues. So the social problem is treated in terms of psychological variables and processes and we don't translate it into the mechanisms which are understandable by the society or which are very near to society and I think that is one reason why psychology is not receiving the attention by <coughs> policy makers and others and it is important to develop some mechanisms of communication what psychologists do the kind of research which they publish, even if it is good, is not accessible to the people, is not available to the policy makers. I think that is one uh, important gap that has happened and I think that the professional bodies have not been able to succeed in creating that impact through their publications, through their journals through their lobbying. I think in a democratic setup it is important that we must showcase the work that has been done. I hope that these ideas provide some uh, impressions about the state of psychology in India. With diversification there is an attempt to look at new developments and I must recognize that the contributions which are made in areas like defense research, in areas like health research, in areas like educational research, I think these different areas pose a number of problems and there is growing interest in these areas and the need of society to provide inputs pertaining to the various social problems is increasing. 
and psychology departments, psychologists and the professional bodies of psychologists have to attend to these needs seriously. Uh, we had a uh, no, co completely you know, elaborated description of uh, the whole phenomena. Uh, I'd like to add a couple of things and go to uh, the other panelists. Uh, say for example it has been observed that uh, psychology usually is not the first preference of students uh, when they come for their undergraduate admission in colleges and universities. Similarly, the high rank uh, holders in the system it has been observed that largely they go to other social sciences stream or other streams of education rather than opting for psychology. Now this in itself could be detrimental for uh, you know, the overall level of undergraduate or postgraduate teaching subsequently. Uh, two, three uh, other important things like uh, in the late 60s when the UGC started the new scheme of uh, Center for Advanced Studies and Center for Special Assistance psychology departments at two universities, Utkal and Allahabad, uh, they were elevated to the status of uh, Center for Advanced Studies. And uh, this whole idea was uh, to develop certain departments which would uh, you know, play some leading role in terms of giving research direction to the country. Uh, simultaneously, the departments of psychology at uh, Delhi, Gorakhpur and uh, Tirupati universities they were elevated to the status of uh, Center for Special Assistance and uh, they were supposed to provide leadership in the areas of research, teaching and professional activity. Now, one can relook at uh, this whole development, at the way things were planned and uh, try to find out that did psychology achieve the stipulated targets that was initially set up by the UGC or uh, in the late 60s. And, uh, what were the factors that led to whatever finally the outcome uh, that we achieved? One interesting thing uh, perhaps in the Indian context also is that the, most of the departments they developed around single dominant scholar and therefore their interest, their training, they decided their specializations of the department. Once they were out of uh, the department, there was a sudden and sharp decline uh, you know, in the level of academic achievements, the level of uh, academic orientation uh, within uh, those departments. Professor Ramadhar Singh uh, has been uh, you know, at one point associated with uh, teaching at IIT Kanpur, then at IIM Ahmedabad, then at National University of Singapore and uh, now at IIM Bangalore. Now that you have seen the two sites at two different uh, point in time, uh, where do you see, sir, psychology in contemporary India? Uh, thank you, Pradyosha. You know, I look at psychology in altogether different way. And let me spend some time over the history. Psychology used to belong to philosophy. So when we decided to become a science, the first major challenge was, can psychology be science? And philosopher Kant said that psychology cannot rise to the level of natural science because it is not possible to treat its data mathematically. To him, mathematical treatment of data is the sine qua non of science. So if you look from this angle, our initial challenge was to establish psychology as a science. Okay. And in that I would like to make some observations. So this challenge to quantify led to psychological testing and assessment as one branch. Okay. And second thing became that if something is science, then you should be able to explain things. You should be able to demonstrate some effects. That led to the experimentation part. And we adopted or borrowed method from physics and chemistry. In fact, the father of experimental psychologists wouldn't say that consciousness is mental chemistry. You see the, how we borrowed and many Indian psychologists claim psychology has a unique problem in this country or this, I disagree with it. In my view, look at the history of science, each discipline is borrowed from somewhere, whether it is physics and chemistry, they are also borrowed from somewhere else. They did not emerge here automatically. And the difficulty which biology faced 
that if you, when Galileo questioned <laughs> the existing theory and came with his heliocentric, what was the suffering from? So we all have a notion and if you come up with something which can question the existing knowledge, people would resist. So biology came late, psychology came still later because we questioned that, look, we are not rational being, we are governed by unconsciousness. So basically you are exposing human being and they would not like to accept something which can show their weakness. So that was the history. So the two challenges we have, can we quantify it? And can we demonstrate something and explain it? So that so assessment led to psychological testing idea, which had wide applications right from the beginning. World War, Gardner Murphy example, Professor Dalal mentioned in India, in in the minds of men question. So we were concerned about application, but the issue was whether we are ready to deliver it. And in that context. Indian Science Congress Association had a section on psychological and educational sciences because they expected that we are on par with other sciences. They also accepted from that point of view. Even in American and British tradition, if you go, who bear the our subjects of a study? Animals, rats, and we used to say psychology of rats, not human beings. Because the challenge was, is it science? And gradually then we shifted to social psychology, organizational psychology. So this is the natural evolution of any science that we start with it and then we said, okay, we can do experiments, our experiments are replicable, we can explain things, we can come up with a theory. So basically we started with learning, memory, perception, these were the things in psychology. Social psychology, organizational psychology, these things came much later. Just like they are complaining they are not relevant for India, in any society these questions are asked. I don't agree to that. They would become relevant at a different point of time. Okay. So when we came that way, psychologists who were not really trained, they cannot really deliver the scientific output. They started promising things or deliverables which they could not deliver. Take for example. Utkal was the first center of advanced study. Allahabad, what was the name? National Development and what, what is your social change. And social change. change. And what is the outcome of it? The policy makers are not so dumb that you give a big title and you don't deliver anything, they would accept it. So we actually demonstrated something which made us incredible. This is the my analysis of it. Now, Go to the other countries. In spite of this, IITs, IIMs, institutes of medical sciences, they started acknowledging psychology. Because by that time we had started human beings. We had started developing different kinds of the scales. If you see to the testing, what would be the market in this country? Just designing tests, examinations can be a big employment agency for psychologists in the country and I don't know, my two other colleagues or three of you can tell me how many psychologists are actually involved in test construction, checking their reliability, their validity, their psychometric properties. How many consulting firms are doing it? What is our involvement? Very little. So assessment part we ignore, where can we demonstrate our competence? Let's come back to the scientific part. When we come to the science part, our training became weaker because when we were not ready to train people as a scientist, we started saying they would do applications. So people started studying tribal groups, poverty, uh, some of the things where we cannot actually deliver. So that exposed us, untrained people, high promises, and we could not deliver it. Contrast it. In 86, IJEC visited Singapore. And Prime Minister of Singapore, Lee Kuan Yew, hosts a barbecue dinner for him. And IJEC said before that he would not allow teaching of psychology in Singapore. IJEC recommended to him that you have all these problems because you don't teach psychology. 
Now, Lee Kuan Yew calls the Prime Minister, how come we do not have a psychology? So somebody who had studied psychology in BA in Britain, he was made other department. And it was started, and then 88 I go there. That department is now housed in Department of Social Work. Right? So they did expect that it would have application part. They did give me a consulting work. Can you help me how Singaporeans can be made a better volunteers? They spent some time, it was a applied problem. Right? Okay. Then they said that okay, when they realized that look, we have to have a full place psych psychology department and it should become a really good department. So now think about it. In 2005, we became a full fledged department. If you go to the website of the existing faculty members, there is not a single who does not have publication in top rate journals. In contrast, what we did here, we did send some people abroad for higher education. We brought them and made them professor so soon that they stopped doing it. So there is no challenge for you to demonstrate these are the expectations here. So naturally there would be a decline. Another thing I noticed that once you have done PhD that becomes like there is nothing to be learned. We did not spend time over self-renewal which is necessary. Now, Professor Dalal is here. The way we used to analyze data and how we are analyzing it. The way we used to store data and how we are doing it. There have been revolutions. So if the PhD I did in 73 with analysis of variance, if I still use that one or if a student says that what note you have given, I am still using, then I feel ashamed of myself. That you did not upgrade yourself. All those things have become redundant. So this we did not concentrate either. And that applies to all the social sciences, not in psychology. Not in psychology in particular, all social sciences. And about experimentation, I would like to mention here that psychologists have made solid and basic contribution as, a, as experimentalists. And our effects have been profound. The best example you can see that economists who we are spending all the time in field, naturalistic situations, which our co psychology colleagues are complaining that we have not been doing. They have been very prominent in planning commission. They are well respected by the government. Right? But what they have realized, this is a science in which I can tell you tomorrow why did my prediction go wrong yesterday. Is this a science? So economics is now coming back and establishing experimental economics. So economics people are establishing lab and we are abandoning lab. Then some people say, we don't deal with social problems. No, psychology is not to deal with social problems. Psychology is basically a study of an individual. Sociologists study social institutions, societies and groups. And once we study individual, then we look for generalization beyond one individual, two individual, three individuals. Then there is a natural extension to the group. But our focus is not social systems. Our focus is individual, then as Kretsch and Kratzfield later on, first he wrote problems and methods of social psychology. Later on he said individual in society. So this is another problem of the orientations. So in sum I would like to say that we got confused about whether psychology is something like a medical science where I can write a prescription and headache and a stomach problem would be solved, that was one. The second issue it became that we ignored this part that first it has to develop like a science and once we do it, science, we train people, we allow them to uh, self-renew themselves and then extend the knowledge. Okay. So this became another issue here okay. and because there was a big gap between what I promise and what I deliver, we lost our credibility. Now, 
Look at the same Singapore now. Why is it famous? Go to their library, go to their publications. Things have changed. In 90s, a Japanese would have problem talking in English in a conference. And as Professor Dalat and Professor Gisra, the publication of Chinese you would see at that time and now. In 2011, we have one article in Asian Journal of Social Psychology. I have a copy I can give you. India used to be higher than Japan and China. Now it has come down. Right? So how come China and Japan went higher than us and we declined when we are 1.2 billion people here? We have better institutions here, better infrastructures here. One problem is the social problem, I see. A global, more, it is happening at a more societal level. What is true in psychology is also true with IIT Kanpur engineers. What we used to publish at that time and what we are doing now, so there is a general decline. But within that, in my opinion, these are the things. But still, if we determine, if we are willing, things can be turned around. It is not total hopelessness. We can turn it around. Okay. Who takes psychology? This is one question. At the Stanford University, for undergraduate courses, what are the courses which are in heavy demand? Psychology and economics. At NUS, psychology and economics are in heavy demand. Most students would like to take psychology, we cannot admit them. And to me, economics is also psychology. Because basically we deal with earning, saving and consumption, which are behavioral issues. And that's why economics is coming back. Psychologists are getting Nobel Prize in economics. But we goofed first. In assessment, we could have distinguished. In making psychology as a science, we could have distinguished. In both come to it. This is my analysis and understanding of this. Thank you. Uh, it is time for me to invite uh, Professor Ajit Dalal now. So, where do you see psychology in contemporary India, sir? You know, the, the, uh, when I look at the prepared scenario of psychology in this country, uh, there are two things I see. There are certain definite traits which are very positive, very hard, very encouraging. And uh, there may be another trend which shows that uh, the bulk of psychology students and the teaching and research uh, does not be at that kind of group. So there are two different extremes I say is emerging in this country. And what uh, we need to do is that uh, our focus somehow on the quality of teaching, quality of students, quality of research, I think that we have to really pay attention to at all three levels. Because you know, if you look at the teaching, the courses which we are teaching in different departments, different universities, uh, these courses need to be significantly, radically revamped to make them more socially relevant, to make them more uh, challenging, and to give students much more freedom, openness, and possibilities for creative pursuits. Because all, all these courses, as I see, have become the examination oriented. The whole approach is that how they can get good marks in the examination do well the you know, uh, program and that becomes the end of any particular uh, result of any particular course. I think uh, that kind of exposure and that kind of uh, opportunity where students can have the learning by doing themselves, whether they are working in the laboratory, whether they are working in the field, whether they have that, uh, that kind of experiential knowledge and then bringing it back and uh, you know putting it in the academic uh, format and structure, and uh, then learning from uh, you know that kind of environment, that kind of uh, teaching and the kind of uh, program teaching program we really need to teach. We really need to develop at places how we need to say. Another is about the even the faculty. You know what I see happening in this country at different places is that most of the faculty are local to the university system I'm talking about. They come from the same city, they come from the same region, and uh, they all from the same, they pass out from the same department, 
So I think uh, that is one of the point which is creating real problem that uh, those who are from the same place, they hardly any motivation. There is hardly any motivation to move out of that place to prove their excellence or their worth or their work at other places. Because their job, they get a job and that becomes a job. And they join there and they retire from their place. I think that we have to really ensure that people, they are not, they're, they're, they're like, just like IIT does, or they're, they're, the students or the of the same department will not get the job at the same place at least for five years or ten years or something like this, so that they have to go out and prove their worth. And one other thing is that once they join the job, there is no challenge. The kind of system which we have is that uh, they will get a job, they will automatically after one year or two years they will get uh, confirmed. And after that, six, seven, six years or eight years, they will get promotion, and they will become leader or they will become associate professor and then become professor without doing anything. And this is the kind of scenario which I see all over the country that people have become professors without even publishing a single paper because they have put in some, some the required amount uh, number of years in the service. I think that that thing we have to change. I mean, there has to be some system. That uh, which uh, encourages the talent, the work, the research, and that is not happening. Emphasis on publication has, I see, increasingly going now. There is the emphasis what should publish, but the, the, the emphasis in terms of the quality, I would say, quality publication. What we have been publishing uh, 20 years back in the international journals, we were competing our papers, we were publishing all over the world. And that is shrinking now. Increasingly, other data shows that Indians are publishing less and less in the prestigious international journal of the Haggadi journals. And we need to understand why is it happening? Because the motivation to publish, the, what what the institutions care for is the number of publications, not on the quality of the publication. And I think uh, that scenario has to change in some way that. The, the quality has to be encouraged, quality has to be promoted. And uh, another thing that I see in the faculty is that I see as I see university system particularly, nobody goes to the field to collect data. The students will go, the research students will go. And when in large number of these researches which are conducted by Indian scholars in the university system, they have no experience of the field, they have no even contact with the field. If they are working in the travel, these are the students will go collect data, come back, give data to the professor and they will write the research. And that kind of scenario, it doesn't lead to any kind of growth uh, on the part of the faculty. So this one thing which I seriously think that the teaching job has not been a very challenge, competitive and uh, rewarding in that sense, that uh, if you do good research, you are rewarded. There is no such system in the country that it may be self-rewarding, yes. But uh, system itself is not geared to identify and really encourage this kind of scholar. This one other thing which is, which is which I see. But uh, I see that there is a, when I look at the new generation, it's friends coming up, there is a lot of enthusiasm for doing something. They really want to prove their work and they, they want to really make some kind of contribution. You know, that kind of enthusiasm, that kind of uh, spirit I see. And what we need to do is that we need to really make a teaching program which are creative and which can fulfill their aspirations. Another thing which is, which is, which is, which is a, a paradox, demand for psychology is growing in the society. So there is a clinical psychology, the counseling, in the industrial area or teaching. The demand is much there. And it, but we the problem is not of uh, uh, jobs availability, but the problem is of availability of the proper uh, competent and qualified people to job, join these, these jobs. If you look at the kind of teaching department, the teaching faculties in this position in the department, they may be in thousands. Every university has problem of teaching faculty. 
they are not finding. And they are not finding and they are not, they are not people available, qualified people. So this kind of paradox that there are availability of jobs and not availability of people who can be, be found suitable for this kind of jobs, I think. And that speaks about the quality of training, the kind of we, we are providing in terms of education, in terms of training, teaching, in terms of uh, other kind of you can, I think that we have to really... Uh, I think somehow, somehow or the other, uh, we need to balance both, you know, in terms of uh, research, which uses, uses diverse kind of methodologies. I think we are to be good in some kind of methodologies, but we have not been able to pick up the sociological methodologies, anthropological methodologies, or methodologies which are, you know, uh, maybe at a group level or at a, a larger level. And these kind of methodologies which are developed to great extent in the system disciplines, these we need to really think and make it educate our students. So they are prepared to work at both the levels, at the individual level as well as the societal level. And they can work not only with psychology strongly, but they will prepare them to work with people, faculty and experts from other disciplines. That is equally important aspect which I see is for this book. So there are both ways, you know, there are and uh, there is hope, I would say. There is hope that uh, that with the kind of churning which is happening and with the kind of situation we are going through, something very good will come out. I, I would like to just add something more to what Professor Dalal said. See, we are producing so many PhD students. Professor Misra is here, he edits our uh, journal. I think both of them can say honestly in front of the camera now. How many people actually know how to review the submitted article yes. or examine a PhD thesis? When I look at the report or review, it seems that the reviewer or examiner has not read the thesis. I would expect that reviewer, examiner should say what the author wanted to do, to what extent they have done, whether they have succeeded, whether they have failed. They would say it's a good piece of work, I recommend it meets the quality requirement of it. How do I know whether the examiner has read it or not? This is the level of professionalism here. So it is not just unique to psychology. This is unique to Indian academia in general. And if government and we are serious, Two points which Professor Dalal mentioned I want to hammer here. First, inbreeding has to stop. A student of that institution cannot be immediately hired at that institution. So a Delhi University a student cannot be lecturer assistant professor at Delhi. Allahabad the student should not be there. They must go outside distinguish and they can come back as a head and professor. We have no objection. But I don't want them to be assistant professor and lecturer under the same professor. This is the one problem which has led to this Guru Chela service orientation. So this is one. Second, I don't think we should, after two years, confirm somebody. We have to borrow this American tenure system. Six years after your PhD, you demonstrate your competence, stay with us. In six years, I make you assistant professor. Even in three years, if you distinguish, if not, bye-bye. This we have to do because that would put pressure on people to for self-renewal doing. No one should be allowed to teach any course more than three years. Because when you develop new course, you have new challenges, you would read new things, you would prepare and you grow. So that should be another thing should be done here. Sabbatical should be made compulsory. Every sixth year you must go out, not stay home and write a book. Go out, some other institution, some other country, recharge yourself and come back. These are the challenges and these are the solutions for us. Otherwise, we are coming down. I'm coming back to the uh, question of uh, imparting quality education. Because we have sudden increase in the number of institutions. We have a, a shortage of faculties reported across universities. I'd like to quote two things. 
uh, very recently the president of India asked the universities and I quote him to identify one department in every university and transform it into center of excellence. And uh, second thing, in uh, the 2006 report of the National Knowledge Commission, which describes the following standards of higher education as, and I again quote, a quiet crisis that runs deep. Now, this, is, this seems to be, you know, much more challenging because at one end you have all these problems that uh, all three of you have been elaborating. On the other end, there is somebody who challenges you that within a short span of time, you identify uh, one department within your university, make it a center of excellence. The one commission of the government suggesting that fine, uh, you know, there is a, a very quiet crisis that runs very deep and needs much more greater attention. And uh, earlier in the lectures and uh, even today, uh, at some time we came at, to this point where we did uh, you know, talk about uh, adopting this American model as you are suggesting right now or uh, how Chinese and Jap Japanese preceded us in terms of uh, quality of education in terms of publication. And uh, within India you have no Indian psychologists who are trained within India and those who go abroad get trained and then come back. Now there could be challenges of multiple level. No? One is that if you have a poor quality at this end and then you have uh, also Indians going abroad and coming back, then how do you create a level playing field at the time of intake? One. Uh, two, if uh, you know, the quality of education has been a much more uh, deeper challenge for us and we all know that the PG teaching and research is the backbone. You know? of training of the prospective faculty members, uh, then it's, the challenge becomes much more, much more intense. Okay. Now, uh, if I ask uh, the three panelists one by one, that how big is the challenge of maintaining the academic standards of faculty members? Okay. Entry level, mid-career and again at the later stage. Uh, it's a tough question because there are three important features of the whole context within which the academic concerns operate. One is the reward structure. The other is the autonomy which is provided to the university departments to run the show in terms of recruiting, in terms of training, in terms of, you know, confirming or providing tenure, things like that. And third is the broader system which furnishes ground for taking initiatives. Now, uh, we, we need to address these challenges in a big way. Uh, when I am using the word in a big way, it means that it requires modification in the uh, regulatory mechanisms. For instance, the departments at times have very little say in choosing the faculty. That is the situation in most of the universities. There is a committee and that committee, in many universities even head of the department is excluded from that committee because the structure which has been created by state governments, they want a different setup. So this has become a, a very crucial question and I think at uh, the apex level, at uh, the level of uh, uh, ministry, at HRD and uh, other mechanisms, they, they need to look at it that how this autonomy can be introduced and the department has say in choosing that so and so is going to provide the uh, right kind of uh, um, person. So we, we need to create this mechanism of autonomy for the departments to choose uh, persons to teach. They, they should not be imposed on the department and whether they are uh, there to do teaching or just sitting and not doing good work. And I think there is a real need to create regulation in terms of evaluating the development of the person as processing used very uh, eloquently the idea of self-renewal. So 
those uh, teachers, those faculty members who think that they need to change themselves, they need to upgrade themselves, they need to learn about new methods, new techniques, new issues. I think this desire has to be created. And I think it should be made compulsory that the courses in a particular uh, department have to be, it should be made mandatory that the courses are revised after three years or so. And I think it will, it will provide new, uh, you know, agenda for the department and to re-examine that. Uh, we have mentioned the two departments as Center for Excellence uh, and the Center for Advanced Studies in uh, Indian universities. We know that the situation in both the departments is not satisfactory. They are not moving in the right direction. And we have provided all the inputs for that. So there are systemic constraints which are there. And uh, unless we attempt to those systemic constraints, things are not going to change. That's a big challenge. As far as uh, students' preference is concerned, I must tell you, at least the experience at Delhi is that best students come to psychology. Now you see here. So not it's, it's Stanford and 94, 95 percent only those students who get such score, only they come to join psychology. So I think uh, we really get very good students who are doing very well in academics and there is uh, uh, quite uh, uh, active participation in various activities. Uh, and uh, our experience is quite good at the level of uh, students. Uh, they do take initiative. Uh, we have created um, uh, arrangements where internship and training is also part of training uh, at uh, undergraduate as well as postgraduate level. We are creating such mechanisms. I think uh, the, the, the kind of challenge at the student level should also uh, be uh, made in a different way. The usual teaching practice where you have to uh, just respond to a set of questions is not enough. So creativity in teaching learning is something which has been missing at many places. We need to bring that, that how learning can be an enjoyable activity and how one can invest the best that person has. So, this is another point and finally I will mention that the kind of reward structure which has uh, been promoted is one which is not, uh, uh, which is quite asymmetrical and we often find that it, the reward is distributed on various other grounds rather than uh, academic merit of the person. So we need to address these issues uh, in a big way in various universities and academic institutions. One more component which requires uh, revamping and reorganization is the PhD program. It's good that uh, UGC has uh, created uh, a mechanism that all PhD programs should be conducted by departments and there should be some work to be done. Uh, that has to be implemented seriously and it should not be merely uh, to, to keep a program uh, in terms of uh, providing some basic information or uh, basic understanding. It, it should be rigorous uh, PhD program. I think that will uh, make the change. Uh, if you look at the PhD program in uh, American universities or anywhere in the world where um, proper education is given, you will see that they have to do so many activities. The qualifying examination is very tough. Then they have to learn all the uh, research methods and they have to clear so many courses. And PhD dissertation is just a small part. And here in most of the universities, everything is just the dissertation. And it is nothing. And that dissertation uh, can be of any kind. I am sorry to note that the, the quantum of work which is required to grant a PhD varies tremendously across universities and even within the department 
different faculty members have different standards. So it is, it is very crucial uh, if you want to improve the quality of education, research and teaching program, PhD program has to be strengthened. And we need to create some kind of quality control. Finally, I would like to bring home the point that so far we have not created any mechanism for accreditation. The various courses which are run in different universities are so varied that what is taught at one university at undergraduate level is the course for the postgraduate level in some other university. There is so much disparity. You, you can't compare the postgraduate education across different universities. I think national bodies must take this initiative and the government should also support it that a course should be accredited and uh, this, this is a, a mechanism which can help to you know, bring in some degree of quality control. Uh, these are some of the suggestions that I think would be relevant to promote healthy growth of the discipline in terms of application, in terms of contribution of knowledge. Thank you. I invite Professor Dalal for his comments. <coughs> well, I think I will take the lead from Professor Mishra. And I think uh, the issue seems to be very critical to me is the issue of autonomy of the university's department, institution. And I will take the, this issue of autonomy at different levels, not that there is the autonomy of the department. It should be autonomy of the teachers within the department, junior level or higher, senior level. And it should be the issue of the autonomy of the students also. And at both levels, I think we have to but I think with the issue of autonomy, when you are talking about autonomy, autonomy cannot be absolute. Autonomy has to go always with accountability. And I think we need to develop a kind of mechanism where this accountability and autonomy can go together. Because you know, the university system, as we know that many times, is the single person who is controlling the full department. is the professor, is the head, and his wish, his uh, preferences, these priorities become the priorities of the whole department. So that kind of ad hocism and that kind of, you know, there has to be, uh, you know, has to, have to, to be thought about it this way. No department can ever go because the, the person goes away or retires and the whole department will collapse. This is what you said, I think I was. So some kind of a democratic system, the accountability means the individual teacher is accountable what they are doing. And I think the core, in terms of the courses that uh, they are, not teaching, I know in my department also, which is advanced sector, so some person is teaching the same course for the last 30 years. Same course. They may be keeping changing some component of it, but the essential thing is the course remains the same. I think that kind of practice is uh, is very damaging for both the students as well as for the teaching and for, for the faculty as well. There is no growth. And that you know, what is very critical that a course should not be taught for more than three years, four years, five, and not five years. It should be changed. Another reason, though, we have not thought about the department in terms of specialization. So every department has to think that it should have a unique identity. That the Delhi department is known for this particular kind of work. The Lama department is known for this kind of specialization, or okay, this kind of teaching, or research work, or Gorupur, or any other department. So that kind of department means we will say distinct identity that somebody wants to work in that particular area. This is the place they need to go. And that thing has not developed in this country. Uh, so is it becoming a kind of general department where people are doing different things, different times, and uh, given the opportunities and the other uh, considerations. And that has to be taken into consideration. Another thing that the courses, I think, are really sick of the courses. I must have seen courses of many universities in development. Same thing with they were teaching 10 years back or 15 years back. Same kind of courses, nothing. They may be adding something or new other thing, but essentially these remain the same. No, no, other students are interested in teaching, teaching learning these courses. No, the faculty is interested in teaching these courses. They are teaching from the notes which they prepared 20 years back. Same notes they keep on uh, using. Uh, I think uh, that system has to change. You know, the courses 
have to be that boy and boys of innovative contemporary as the element both is and another thing is that this actually they should be an effort to encourage students to take courses from other disciplines if somebody is doing courses in ma in psychology i think they should be mandatory that he doing one or two courses from other other departments and that kind of system because you know if you look into the expansion of the understanding and knowledge and then you go to that very important that that has to be um, considered Another is kind of rigid structures with the, the examination and the evaluation and all the university system is very ancient and antiquated and I think obsolete, obsolete. And we are mind, mindlessly following the same examination system, same way of evaluating, same way of understanding. I think we have to pay serious attention to that how we can bring in innovation and creativity and openness and newness. On the, uh, within the within the teaching program, that we students get their opportunity to experiment, experience, and move move. Ahead. I think that thing is uh, is not happening uh, most of the universities. So they are simply becoming uh, degree churning institutions. Nothing but degree churning. And there is pressure from the government that you intake increase the intake. Every time there is a pressure from the unions, from the government, or from the student unions. Or from other sources that you take more students, increase from 150 to 200. So we have a small lab for 30 or 40 students, and now we are teaching 200 students. For example, like because you have to take the students, and the structure has not been nothing has happened, but there has to be done. I think within that kind of atmosphere, uh, uh, we think that uh, students and teachers can really make some difference. For that, these kind of structural changes have to be made. Professor Singh, your comment. Thank you. You see, basically, I would elaborate on what they had about the examination part. I don't think this end semester or end year exam is needed. We should have to have a series of activities in which they have testing, they have reports, they write a thesis, they write a paper, at least independent study. You know. Where we really say that look, this is a science you have to do and you have to report, and this has to be done right at the undergraduate level. Okay, so this is one. Second one, the PhD one. I am thinking that all good schools are known not so much by their professors as they are known by their PhD alumni. Right? Most of the research of the famous professors are by their Doctoral students, professors would give ideas, do the final editing. That is not happening here. We need to strengthen that culture. Now, one reason may be that the professor is not ready, and I admit that this is true. We have faced in many institutions when I get the thesis or examiner, you know, they cannot understand the report. They say I have no time to revise, allow the thesis, and then I will take up later. PhD is. A piece which a student should show to other with great pride and delight that this is what I have done. So that part we have to strengthen, and in fact, the PhD examiner's report should be made public. What one has written about the thesis, and PhD viva should be in public oral audience where those reports should be shown to everyone. So that they can see whether the examiner has actually read or not, because I am thinking the examiner is as gullible, as <laughs> likely to be persecuted as the candidate, because candidates I have done, you have approved it, so I am getting the title. So this is at the PhD level. Now two things I learned from China in 2011. We had a conference in Yunnan. I think Professor Lilavati Krishnan from here was there, and I requested her that please write a letter to our honourable minister, Mr. Sibal. He should visit and see this campus. The new campus of Yunnan University is built in 3,200 hectares, and it had every possible thing, tip top. 
a big campus like that I had seen only at Ohio State. This is somewhere in Texas, there is another big campus. So look at how China is investing in education and how we are doing it. So this is another point we need. A second thing in China I learned, all the famous Chinese professors from different countries in summer, they are appointed visiting guest faculty. They come, they are provided accommodation, whether they pay on honorarium, I have no idea. And their job is to share their knowledge with the PhD students. They are doing it. In our case, we have the talent here. Look at, I'll give example here. Saying that we are no good, I have difficulty believing it. I give example. J.P. Das, Rabindra Kanungo of Patna University, they go, do their PhD, come back, they feel dissatisfied, they go and they distinguish outside. Nalni Ambadi of Delhi University, Maharabian Banaji of Bombay University, both are now at Stanford, she was at Harvard, right? So these are the young ones I am saying. Okay, Krishna Samani who is at he just stand for the crown. Now, they can also make a mark, but the, uh, in our case, the problem is we are not giving them environment or infrastructure conducive to creativity. And one reason is that we have ignored. We said, take it for granted. Or what we say, chalta hai. I am not comfortable with the word chalta hai. As long as each one of us says, let us do our best. Not ki chalta hai. Or this is what happens in India. I said, no, then no. we have to, what is in your opinion, best we should be doing it. That we are not taking it. Unless we do these things, our education cannot be turned around and we cannot afford to lose sight of it. We have to give priority to education, we have to spend time and psychology is as important as any other science. It has become very powerful, it is most useful. Question is how we train the students, how we... And the last point I would like to make, we have been hearing about application. When X-ray was invented, was what invented with application purpose? What is the application now? Let's go back to psychology. When B.F. Skinner talked of operant conditioning in programmed instruction or computer aided learning we have here, aren't these good examples of application? Bandura social learning and its self-efficacy theory, did it solve many problems or not? So application should flow naturally. If we establish ourselves as a science. But without establishing ourselves as a science, application would not come. But this does not mean that I am opposed to this. We can take two approaches. There is a social issue, there is an applied problem. With the existing knowledge, if I can solve that problem, and that helps us either to extend or revise the theory, that's also a solid contribution. Or I can simply take a theoretical idea and say that I'm going to apply elsewhere, like the example I said, operant conditioning or observational learning, how they were applied. We can do like, so we are not really balancing it. Sometimes there is no theory, there is no idea, we do something and we start some research because I think in one of the lecture also I saw one word, uh, your inclusiveness. Your, uh, I, I saw some word inclusiveness in one or another not say. There are two words in this country to become famous, good governance and inclusiveness. <laughs> so sometime whether we can deliver or not, we should be very, very careful. Who, whose lecture had term inclusiveness somewhere? Your or uh, his? You lose yourself. <laughs> oh, some, some, something like, you see, so we don't have to go by the popular things. Okay? First, we convince and we can make a mark. I, I actually developed respect for psychology 
because I had to teach psychology to engineering student here. I had to teach psychology to management student here. I had applied problem. I did not know meaning of reliability and validity until BHEL gave us a project to uh, come up with a test for their uh, engineer training. There I saw the utility. When it came to the question of designing performance appraisal, then I realized the importance of validity. They said, limited water we have, how do we distribute among the fighting farmers in Gujarat? Then I learned the importance of Sheriff social uh, ordinate goal. So applied problems make you think and apply your knowledge. So that challenge should be there. I am not saying that ignore them. Otherwise, of what kind of science? Ultimately, science is for human welfare and happiness to solve the problem. But premature application should be avoided. Premature application should be avoided. And you remember, like as I said, Indian Science Congress thought we are a science. But I think now we have been removed. No, we are still there. But the uh, peripheral. No, so you see, somebody wanted to respect us. We did not command the respect. <laughs> the challenge is on us, not on them. So this is all I have to say. Yes. Uh, we have been talking largely about the structural problems. If we come to uh, problems that basically pertains to individual, two individuals or a cluster of individuals, I would like to quote Professor Dalal from his writing A Journey Back to the Roots Psychology in India where he refers, I may quote him, that the professional bodies of psychological associations rarely took any stand on vital national issues. They are more interested in holding annual conferences and meetings where rarely substantive issues were passionately debated. Most of the conflicts that weakened these professional organizations were of an interpersonal nature. There was no larger vision of psychology to be. And uh, if you look at uh, you know, experience of oneself or others, you find problem in terms of appreciation of colleagues and uh, the type of collaborative studies that are usually performed. That is one. And two, uh, you know, these professional uh, bodies, okay, how do you elaborate their role uh, in terms of teaching, training, creating resources and continuing education? I'll first go to Professor Nisha. Uh, it's uh, very sad to note that uh, the way professional bodies are conducting themselves is really become a problem. And people don't have ownership. People don't give the space to professional organizations in their activity, in their academic agenda as it should be given. So we don't take seriously the symposium at the National Academy of Psychology meet. What we do is that we take it very loosely and we don't perform the way we should perform. The professional bodies have this responsibility that they should motivate people they should create a platform to present ideas, project various issues and relate to society, create a dialogue with society, develop certain policies and try to convince the policy makers that well these are the key issues and this is the position of this professional body. So I think this work has not been done and uh, this requires uh, rethinking that how to connect with these organizations and how to run these organizations effectively. Uh, as you have indicated earlier that there are individuals in departments and when the individual goes then the department collapses. That's true and that has happened in many places. So the kind of Training which is there 
that requires a kind of authority and those people who are working with that authority find no no idea and and the group you know dismantles i would like to use this phrase that then there, there, there is no activity i think this this uh, kind of orientation to to relate to others is a big problem there is a need to provide this input that people should as as buddha said atma deepo bhav that that you should look within yourself and try to become a leader to to become an innovator to develop new ideas to go for creativity i think this element has to be introduced in teaching i will give you one example uh, usually in practicals teachers provide one problem and the entire class follows that problem and at times some students do the work and others copy i in my uh, practical classes pose before them a challenge and ask them to design as many you know uh, kinds of activities and it may be done individually or in a group i also give this freedom and i prefer that three or four students should work and you know take it as a challenge and go for broader issues so for instance i i ask them to take up the problem of social representation and we use the theoretical framework developed by maskovici and others so social representation pertaining to so many things it may be old age or it may be democracy or it may be god or it may be education and and they have to use different kinds of methods and activities and they are enjoying it so i think there is a possibility to create variety and instead of preparing one report and being copied by all the students i think there should be some opportunity to test their ideas think in your ways uh, our teaching program has a space for this it requires effort and uh, some innovative thinking on the part of faculty and instructors i think some new orientation is required in in uh, preparing our teachers i, I will again emphasize self renewal we have refresher courses which is uh, you know such courses are done just to uh, ensure that uh, the promotion is uh, there and it doesn't serve much purpose i think we need to reorganize that and every time new issues should be taken up new method should be taken up and it should be more inspiring and and helping to identify uh, new issues and new perspectives i, I remember in one of his uh, uh, interventions professor ramadhar singh mentioned the need to think in different ways and he elaborated the point of teaching program and quality of teaching program which is central to uh, revamping higher education i think the intervention has to be done at that level only then we will be able to excel others and our own self Thank you. quick comments professor singh now about professional association whatever we had they all seem to have failed we had indian science congress association we did not perform well then we had indian psychological association and i am like member of both then i also got drafted in uh, nio and i can announce in public that i resigned because i thought it would be wasting my time uh, there for any professional association to be hybrid there are some necessary requirement number one first it should have a home which our association does not have it should have an office and it should have a motto we should describe everything clearly we should monitor the quality so many issues we are saying about journal we are saying about reviewers we are saying about phd programs because we have no monitoring by the professional body similarly the testing you see if industry and other consulting firms are producing tests and selling without 
approval by a psychologist, it's also our professional failure. Because we should be certifying whether they, that test is usable or not. They should get a license from the association. That we are not doing. So we really in a bad condition about the professional associations. And my recommendation was that actually anyone who is older than 60 should be out from the association and everything should be given to the youngster ones. But it seems that older ones do not want to leave. So I gave example of leaving. So this is my analysis. Because I quoted uh, Professor Dalal said, but I will come uh, for your comment once again at the end. So your comment, sir. <coughs> well, I think uh, it's very unfortunate we don't have the very vibrant, active uh, natural body, natural regional body in this country, as far as psychology is concerned. I think now uh, was there, and even that time we were hoping that there will be some regional branches or regional associations uh, which will be catering to that particular region. And I think that, that kind of thing has not caught up that uh, they are associations and there are more regional associations and there is a network of associations within the country which are doing activity, professional activity in the field of psychology. It's really, I would say, uh, unthinkable that a kind of a body like now, National Academy of Psychology, there is a regional house meeting, meeting body meets and there are 200 or 300 people only. A country of 1.2 billion population and there are more than 20 or 30,000 psychologists who have passed out in psychology and there are only 200 members and I have not seen more than that. Maybe maximum 300. We have 200, no. I don't know, maximum 300 I have seen. I think that is a, that speaks volumes about the kind of involvement and engagement as a professionals we have in this kind of large uh, you know, bodies. Another thing I will very much agree with Professor saying that I think the, the, the leadership of these organizations has to go to the younger generation. It has to be. Because I think they have the enthusiasm, they have a long, a long way to go and they have more at stake in terms of their professional growth. And I think uh, their enthusiasm, their innovation and their creativity and their, I think uh, these associations can be made more and more vibrant. I see one thing very strange in these uh, so annual meetings and conferences that the students only provide audience. I rarely see that students are actively participating in the, uh, in the proceedings of the association. Maybe one or two sometimes they come with a student session, sometimes a block session, they block for students. Maybe. But a student has to play a much, it's not only a learning experience, experience of participating in a, in a this kind of body and learning that kind of professionalism. I think what we need, lack in this country is that kind of professionalism, that kind of reason that our responsibility is much larger, larger than the teaching of our students. We have responsibility to the discipline also. And that uh, is one thing that I seriously think that unless these bodies are strengthened, I saw it's psychology is not going to grow in this country. Uh, now let's uh, wrap up uh, the discussion. Uh, one interesting thing that came forward uh, by all the three panelists was uh, basically extending psychology to <coughs> allied areas. Okay. Even you went to the extent of saying that say economics is now regressing back yes. and coming to yes. psychology. Uh, I uh, recently saw an interesting book by Professor Mishra, uh, Psychology for Nurses, along with uh, three other uh, authors. I have seen a few work of uh, psychologists uh, you know, very closely working with social work people. Uh, very few, but there are few uh, researchers in our country who have worked very closely with uh, medical professionals. So, uh, there are some examples, not many, but some examples of extending psychology beyond the thought uh, dimensions. Okay, even thinking of uh, psychology for nurses would be a quantum jump from the defined allied boundaries of psychology. No. Let me just add here one point. Most of the schools of nursing have psychologists or faculty members. Yeah. 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 Wisconsin, I have seen. In US, we have a school of nursing now where we have hired psychologists. Yes. And uh, after all these difficulties that we have discussed, no? uh, there, there were several uh, you know, suggestions, there were you know, rays of hopes you know, reflected by all the three panelists. 
So, uh, to conclude uh, the way forward, very quick comment, okay, that how do we meet the global benchmark uh, with respect to our uh, teaching, with respect to our research, with respect to our uh, professional conduct? Professor No, whatever we have recommended here, if we implement now, it would take us 10 years to reach the international. Don't think that we will do now and reach tomorrow. It would take us 10 years, just like what Japan situation I had seen in 90, by 2000, cross-cultural editor in Japanese, social psychology Yoshi Kashima was editor, Sivarov Kitayama was editor of personality and social bulletin, right? They can come and become editor. Shouldn't we have a day that some Indians should be editing JPSP or experimental psychology or applied psychology? Academy of Management Journal was edited by a lady uh, from Hong Kong University. So it would take time if we take proactive actions now. Quick response to Sir Mishra. Uh, I think uh, there should be investment. Investment not only material but intellectual investment by the university community, by the colleagues. Uh, in terms of uh, developing profession, which is responsible, accountable, and which relates to the growth of discipline, we need to uh, do some serious thought. Yes, it's right that the younger people should participate, but I, I don't agree that the older people should leave it. I, I think that is not the answer to the problem. The, the older people should provide inputs, they help the younger people to grow, they should work as mentors, we, we need to create, maintain and sustain the dialogue between the younger and older colleagues. I, I, I think that we, we need to create mechanisms to create more motivation, to encourage people to, to participate. Uh, these days communication is easy, but we, we have not been able to communicate effectively. We have not been able to convince people and ensure that the participation is going to help them to, to improve their standing as a psychologist, as a learner, as a faculty member. We need to create possibilities and occasions and arrangements to attract more and more um, you know, colleagues from the younger as well as older generation and it's uh, our joint responsibility. Uh, we look forward to uh, senior colleagues to, to contribute to this endeavor. I hope that we will be able to uh, create a platform where there is a possibility to indulge in dialogue, uh, offering critique and Learning from that critique, I, I, I think that uh, uh, it's our responsibility as colleagues that we should help others to grow. I think uh, it's right time to, to think in this direction. Mr. Yes, Dilla, your comments? Uh, well, uh, the point I think I would like to make uh, in this context is that, uh, you know, uh, improving the quality, improving the standards, and uh, improving the uh, teaching program, I think it's a long-term process. And I think uh, what we need to do in that context is that uh, one thing which Professor Mishra is talking, I think I agree with mentioning class. I think we have not, we have to take this task of mentoring mentoring at, the, at different levels, mentoring in terms of the teacher's training, mentoring in terms of the PhD student, mentoring in terms of other kind of, uh, you know, encouraging other activities. This is one thing which he has already talked about. It. Other thing is I think psychology has to open now for non-psychology students. I can see that many people who have, students who have really contributed are those who have come from other disciplines and come to psychology. Engineering students may be one, medical students may be even students from uh, uh, other science streams. 
I think uh, rather than restricting it to psychology, which we are doing in university system very much, the only psychology students uh, can do PhD or maybe the allied discipline people can do PhD. I think it has to be really widely open. That's why an Indian student cannot join the PhD program. We have a requisite qualification. So that way, I think that kind of cross breeding, that kind of breeding, you know, from taking widening, widening our net for our PhD student, I think. Uh, that may help us in uh, really getting good uh, in motivated uh, uh, faculty and researchers. Uh, so friends, uh, you, know, you had uh, three eminent scholars of this country. Uh, they have uh, been fantastic teachers, I must tell you, uh, those of you who have not been to their classes. Uh, fantastic teachers. You can uh, you know, read the general contributions from them. No? Fantastic research, sustained uh, you no know, effort that has been put over you know, decades together. You have a good number of books coming from them, and uh, I must thank all three of you, uh, you know, to help the audience understand and finally to guide them to position the state of psychology in India uh, with respect to teaching, with respect to research, with respect to professional conduct, and finally you also heard the way forward from our three panelists.